Hello, join me on tonight in half an hour. Action girl Trish tackles the secret sport of bouldering and John Baxter solves a pigeon's problems with super glue. That's at 6.30. <laughs> Thursday on Yorkshire. Start the evening off with Emmerdale at 7. Morning. Morning. Survival follows the stone curlew in a rare success story at 7.30. It's my worst fear, but if it is an abduction, I'd rather we were quick off the mark. It'll be dark soon. The bill at 8, followed by rapid responses in blues and twos at 8.30. And a new series at 9. Bring him here! For the thief takers. That's Thursday on Yorkshire. Yorkshire Weave Calendar, presented by Krista Ackroyd and Mike Morris. Hello and welcome to Calendar on this Thursday evening, the 25th of January. These are the main stories tonight. The legacy of Nurse Beverly Allert, victims' parents fight for compensation for their suffering. The expert said that because we wasn't there at the time, we don't qualify. £79 a year to keep him alive, but the government won't pay. And meet Kelvin, the victim of animal cruelty, who could be saved by a change in the law. It's almost five years since Nurse Beverly Allett murdered four children at a Lincolnshire hospital and harmed nine others. Many were left disabled for life, but the parents of the victims are still fighting for compensation. Tonight, Calendar can reveal that the families are being forced to take court action to claim payments for the trauma that they've suffered. With this exclusive report, Jim Greensmith. Yeah. For the past five years, Peter Phillips has kept a detailed diary of what happened when his daughters were in hospital. Katie Phillips survived an attack by Beverly Allett. Twin sister Becky died. Allett was found guilty of murdering four children and attacking nine other patients at Grantham Hospital in Lincolnshire. She's now serving life imprisonment, but the health authorities still haven't finalised compensation. I think the hospital solicitors are deliberately using delaying tactics, um, hoping the parents will get fed up and just drop the cases. How has this been affecting your family over the last five years? What I think is all the hospital solicitors are doing is, is adding to the stress and the trauma. Um, I think they're actually making us suffer just as much as Beverly Allett did. Katie Phillips has brain damage. She has therapy at a medical centre in America which uses dolphins to develop children's abilities. The Phillips know they will get trauma compensation eventually, but some families have been told they don't qualify after the Hillsborough disaster ruling that if people weren't present at the time, they can't claim for trauma. When schoolboy Michael Davidson was attacked by Alit, his parents weren't at the hospital. According to the psychiatrist, um, I was in need of uh, um, payment because I was completely traumatised by it. But the expert said that because we wasn't there at the time, we don't qualify, so our case has been chucked out. It's incomprehensible, really, why the health authority... I mean, they're supposed to look after people's health, not keep them permanently traumatised. The Trent Health Authority made interim payments to the victims as soon as Alec was convicted. Five years on, they now say they hope to make interim ex gratia payments for post-traumatic stress. But that won't stop court action by the parents. It has now been three years since proceedings were started on behalf of these parents, and I find it inconceivable that we are still waiting to hear from the health authority the offers to compensate those parents for what they went through. And the parents also remember this comment made immediately after Alid was convicted. In the exceptional circumstances of this case, and regardless of any legal liability, the health authorities wish to provide some recompense to the hospital victims of Beverly Alid without their having to be involved in further legal action. A court date for the trauma claims is expected soon. 
Well, with us is uh, Charles Gillett, uh, Charles, a solicitor who specialises in these sort of cases, although not, it must be said, the uh, Alec case in particular. Thanks for joining us. Um, it does seem, and I know this is an old route we're taking here, but compensation depends, it can depend on a question of minutes. How fast did the parents, how were the parents on getting to a hospital? How fast were they on getting to the scene of a tragedy? It does seem almost a nonsense. Well, in this type of case, the law is very clear that parents uh, whose children are injured in this sort of circumstance are only entitled to claim damages for the stress they suffer if they see the accident itself or its immediate aftermath, mm. which is fairly closely defined um, and would probably not be a period more than 20 or 30 minutes after the accident. You see, I mean, uh, this is where the law would seem to be insensitive. Clearly, parents who are absent may actually take on a far greater burden of guilt and actually be even more traumatised. Well, that's certainly true. Different people obviously react in different ways, but I think the supposition which you make is a fair one. The Law Commission has recently published a paper, in fact, recommending change in the law in this field. One of the changes is that the time limit, which presently applies, should be removed in cases where the person claiming is a very close So there close could relative. be a change there. Is there too there much litigation? Be. Are people being rushed to courts? to try and find money to replace people they simply can't replace. Money can never replace a lost life. Well, it's certainly true that money can't replace a lost life, but many people do uh, make claims of this sort. But in fact, the statistics show that a far smaller percentage or a, a small minority of people who can claim actually do pursue claims of this type. We must leave it there. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Gillett. Thank you. Tonight's other main story is that an inquest has begun on a woman who died after what should have been a routine operation at Grimsby Hospital. Kay Hallberg should have been ready to leave hospital just hours after having surgery. But her husband, Michael, told a court today she never returned home. An investigation's already been launched into patient care at the hospital. Paul Burland reports from Grimsby Coroner's Court. Michael Hallberg could only stand back and watch as his wife's condition deteriorated gradually. Kay Hallberg had a routine DNC operation to stop heavy periods, but complications set in and seven weeks later, she died of multiple organ failure. Mr. Hallberg told the inquest that his wife's last words to him were, I love you. Then she went to sleep and they never spoke again. Mrs. Hallberg had undergone the operation before in 1987, but she was referred to Grimsby Hospital again in 1993 after her periods got progressively worse. The same operation was carried out by Dr. Padma, who was working there on a temporary basis. A small piece of the bowel was found in one of the samples taken during the operation. Consultant gynaecologist Michael Muldoon, here on the right, decided to investigate, and during that operation, he found that he needed to repair part of the uterus and the bowel. But he was criticised in court by Dr Peter Buchan, here wearing the green coat, who helped to compile the pathologist's report. In his opinion, it was bad practice for a gynaecologist to operate on the bowel. After this second operation, Mr. Hallberg was told his wife would be ready to go home in a couple of days. But he said she started to turn yellow, her eyes were yellow, and she got progressively worse. The court heard that consultant general surgeon Henry Pearson examined the uterus and bowel and found problems which hadn't been attended to. He carried out surgery to repair them. But soon after, Mrs. Hallberg was taken by helicopter to St. James's Hospital in Leeds, where she later died. The hearing's expected to finish on Monday. Coming up in a moment, the old soldier waging a battle with the government over just £79. First, more stories from Calendar East with Alan Hardwick. Thank you, Krista. Yet another oil slick is threatening wildlife along the East Coast tonight. Scores of dead birds have been washed up, and it's the third spillage the area has seen in recent months. A rescue operation is now underway. Once again, the birds have become the innocent victims of an oil spillage. Almost 100 oil-drenched birds have been washed up alive. Many more have been found dead. The beaches around Hornsea, Bridlington and Withensea are being searched for more casualties. We'll carry on searching as long as the birds are coming this yard. They'll be given the best chance possible and dispatched to our hospitals as quick as we possibly can with the help of volunteers locally. It's the third time in recent months that the East Coast wildlife has been under threat. Late last year, hundreds of guillemots and razorbills were killed. These pictures reveal just how they must have suffered before they died. And just three weeks ago, the lives of more birds were claimed. 
The problem is, again, oil pollution at sea that's affecting these birds. They're becoming disabled due to the oil, unable to feed and having difficulty surviving and coming ashore in a suffering state. Once again, it's thought the oil has come from a ship illegally cleaning out its tanks. It's also thought those responsible will never be traced. A 30-year-old man has appeared in court in connection with the death of a Grimsby man almost a year ago. Greg Dalton, who was 20, died from a massive heroin overdose last February. His wife Donna was in court at Grimsby today to hear Anthony Crowder, who's from Lincoln, charged with conspiracy to murder her husband. He was found dead in a house in Cleethorpes last February. Police have been granted special extensions to continue questioning two other men. Crowder was remanded in custody for seven days. A cross-border business development that could eventually create up to 4,000 jobs has been unveiled in Lincolnshire. Lincoln City Council and North Castephen Council are joining forces to promote a business park with housing and leisure areas alongside. The land at Decoy Farm straddles the boundary between the two authorities. The land is close to the Lincoln Bypass and it's felt would be highly attractive to any new companies. A campaign has been launched in, by councillors in Bridlington to save a top entertainment complex. Financial problems affecting the Spa Royal Hall were revealed in a budget document presented to the new East Riding Authority. It's feared the spa, which has been used as a venue for some of the biggest names in the music world, may fall victim to budget cuts when Humberside is reorganised in April. That's all from me for the moment. An 80-year-old war veteran has gone into battle against the government in a row over who pays for the medical equipment, which quite simply keeps him alive. Cancer destroyed Daniel O'Connell's voice and he now spends 24 hours a day connected to a humidifier, which was provided by a charity. Without it, he would die. But the government says he has to pay £79 a year to maintain the machinery himself even though the alternative is losing his independence and going into a hospital at a cost of more than £300 a day. Dick Taylor has this report. Gasping for breath, Daniel O'Connell makes it through another day connected to the high-tech equipment which keeps him alive. His larynx removed in a cancer operation 17 years ago, he now breathes through a hole in his throat. His humidifier keeps him alive but it costs £79 a year to service. Money, the NHS says, it simply cannot afford. Their patient is barely able to express his anger. I watch nighters sit here every day of my life on medical treatment at my expense. After paying the national service for 31 years. The £1,200 machine was provided by the Soldiers, Sailors and Air Force Association because the health service couldn't afford it. The Department of Social Security say there are no grants available to service the machine. If it breaks down, Mr O'Connell will have to go into hospital. Well, I was one of four products in the services. The three models apart from me. We didn't all come on me then. But uh, what good does it do me? What thanks am I getting now? The row provoked a furious exchange in the Commons. Cannot afford to supply life-saving equipment such as a nebulizer and humidifier to an 80-year-old constituent of mine suffering from cancer. Well, I suggest the honourable gentleman provides my right honourable friend with the details of that case so that it can be examined. And if he were, ge if he were genuinely concerned about the matter, that is what he would have done. Daniel O'Donnell can't afford to pay himself. He believes that after offering to lay down his life in the war, the authorities owe him a debt of honour, a debt they're now refusing to pay. And the benefits agency, which oversees most of the government's benefits payments, have just promised a full investigation as to whether any help can now be given to Mr O'Connell. But for the moment, we can now talk to Bill Mishy, Mr O'Connell's MP. Mr Mishy, we saw you there crossing swords with the Prime Minister. Can you really offer... Any hope of help for Bill? Yes, I think we can. Um, the very fact that uh, uh, it's been highlighted on your programme, the very fact that the uh, Prime Minister got rather upset about uh, the content of my question, and uh, just, I've just heard for the first time through uh, your programme that the uh, welfare people are looking again at this particular case. So, as far as I'm concerned, progress has been made after a long, long time. 
My question is quite simple. Why have we had to wait this long when Daniel, who's been quite good, looking after himself, saving the health uh, service lots of money, why is it we've had to wait so long to get some action? I mean, obviously, Daniel is very upset. Do you think it's any way to treat somebody who served his country and has been a really good member of the community for so long? No, absolutely not, and he's quite right. He's paid 31 years into the health service, obviously worked, obviously served his country, and obviously paid his taxes. And I think it's a bad deal for someone at his age not getting this treatment free, including having the equipment bought for him. It does seem a little bit of a nonsense when it would cost £300 a day if Daniel had to go into hospital. Yeah, yeah absolutely crazy. I mean, it's economic madness, but the way things work now with the health service and including the, uh, the Department of Social Services is everything has to work by rule and regulation and not enough um, decisions can be made which are sensible in the case of, uh, of Daniel, okay. which says, OK, let's deal with it, let's pay the money out. Thanks very much, Mr. Mishy. OK. Still to come, then, is this really the end of the line for a piece of history? The Mitsubishi Charisma needs no beautiful models. No exotic locations. And no expensive photography. And no groovy theme music. The new Mitsubishi Charisma. Some cars have it, some don't. Nothing beats Otravine at clearing the way. It starts to work in seconds and gives relief for up to 10 hours. Otravine, the all clear for noses. Join me for tonight in 15 minutes. Vet John Baxter solves a pigeon's problems with superglue and we investigate the secret sport of bouldering. That's after calendar. Welcome back. A son's grief has tonight turned to anger after his mother was denied a Jehovah's Witness funeral despite refusing a blood transfusion because of her faith. Ira Younger died days after being involved in a car accident near to her home in Horsforth in Leeds. But when her family turned to the faith which had provided Mrs Younger with her values, they claim religious elders turned their backs. Jehovah's Witness ministers, however, say the woman was not a member of their congregation. Katie Oscroft has this story. A handwritten letter broke the news to Ira Younger's grieving family that she'd been refused a funeral service in the Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's Witnesses. Mrs Younger was in a car accident and refused a blood transfusion in keeping with her faith. Her husband allowed it to be carried out when she lost consciousness. She didn't survive and never knew about the transfusion or about the funeral she wasn't allowed to have. She followed the faith through to the end. Um, my father and myself had to give uh, written um, authorization for blood to be given to my mother, to give her a fighting chance. And in the end, she was kicked in the teeth for it. I received a letter saying that, unfortunately, as my mother wasn't um, a Jehovah's Witness uh, follower as much as, as she should have been, they couldn't hold the service at the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses in Horsforth. The family's grief quickly turned to anger. Ira Younger's widower defaced this religious pamphlet his wife had kept. The Jehovah's Witness Minister for Horsforth, Philip Harrison, said that Mrs Younger was not a member of the congregation here and never had been. He said he wasn't aware that she'd refused a blood transfusion on the grounds of her faith when he was asked about a funeral. Mr Harrison said he now planned to discuss the matter with Mrs Younger's family. I'd like them to certainly think about what has gone on previously. So no, no one else has to go through this. It's hard enough losing a relative and having the trouble of what we've been through. Ira Younger's family say she was brought up with the faith. They're angry that she was denied its final blessing. 
Katie Oscroft with the younger family. All right, confession time. How long is it since you went to the dentist? And is the reason that, like so many of us, you're absolutely petrified of the sound of that drill? Yes, even if you're a regular visitor, I bet you really don't like going. And early research shows at least half of us are worried about getting treatment for our teeth. But for one in every ten, that fear is so strong, they simply don't go to the dentist at all. Anxiety about visiting the dentist is known as dental phobia. But never fear, help is now at hand. As Sarah Willett has been finding out when she met one reformed dental phobic. It's taken Lorraine Midgley 20 years to be able to sit back and relax in the dentist's chair. The deep-rooted fear which kept her away so long sprang from the way she was treated as a child. Being told, don't be such a silly girl, sit in the chair, open your mouth, behave, be good and then actually being held down whilst I was anaesthetised, and that's remained with me. I'm just going to show you the tooth, so remembering okay. that it tickles on your hand, but when it touches your fingernail or tooth, it vibrates a little bit more. Right. Okay, so listen for the noise. Learning how drills and instruments are used is one way of helping a patient overcome their anxiety, but all too often all a dental phobic won't even make it to the chair. A dental phobic won't be able to approach a dentist for an appointment or for treatment uh, and some dental phobics can't actually walk past a dental surgery without feeling very worried. Some dental phobics suffer from panic attacks uh, brought on simply by the thought of going to the dentist. High-tech goggles allowing people to watch their favourite physios is another method of relaxation, but experts say more detailed research is needed if dentists are to find out the cause of the phobia people have different needs. Some people may need to have some sessions um, with a psychologist, a, a clinical psychologist, um, or a dentist who has been trained in, in psychological techniques. And it may take many visits for them to get used to um, a particular dentist and also having the opportunity to get used to equipment before actually embarking on dental treatment itself. Research will begin at the Leeds Dental Institute in March, and experts hope in the long term it'll mean more people conquering their fears with a smile. Oh, there we are then. Oh, I still don't fancy it, you know. The more they try to distract me, the more my mind concentrates on that big, long needle. Oh, well, I can tell you we've got help on hand for the humble hedgehog. First, though, more of today's news. Yes, more news now from Calendar East News Desk. Coast Guards are demanding answers from the skipper of a ship which was at the centre of a huge search operation. The vessel was spotted off the German coast this morning. The crew were safe and well and finally made radio contact with port authorities four days after leaving Grimsby. They were apparently unaware of the alert. Relief at Humber Coast Guard as the German ship was finally located. The search for the Halstenbeck, which left Grimsby four days ago bound for Denmark, was launched after it failed to answer calls and couldn't be traced. The ship carrying ferrous sulphate had six people on board. A search and rescue helicopter from RAF Leckenfield was involved in the operation, along with four other aircraft, as fears grew for the crew's safety because of the atrocious weather conditions. At about five o'clock this morning, the vessel called a German radio station. I think the words from the radio station were rather choice, something like, where the hell have you been? But the cost of the operation is put at tens of thousands of pounds an hour, and the agencies involved will not be able to recoup any money from the vessel's skipper or owner. Questions are now being asked. We would just want to know that, in fact, all was well on board, and that why the communications had not been answered, why all efforts to contact the ship yesterday, uh, and he hadn't heard one call. However, Humber Coast Guard say yesterday's operation is all part of the service and a price cannot be put on a life. Conservation experts involved in the restoration of both Windsor Castle and York Minster are now turning their attention to a church in Lincolnshire. The project means local people will at last be able to see one of the church's ancient treasures. <laughs> Restorer's delicate touch at the beautiful St Mary's Church in Long Sutton, which dates back to the 12th century. A talented team are working here using the same craftsmanship they employed so successfully at York Minster. The fire there resulted in a huge restoration scheme watched by the nation, but the same care and attention singles out the work here. Yes, very similar. Um, a recognised range of conservation materials and practices are used. Um, 
very careful methods are always applied and the work is slow so that you don't damage anything. The project centres around a large panel showing the Ten Commandments that's been hidden from the public's gaze behind a curtain for years. They seem to have been delighted. They, uh, some didn't know it was there and uh, others knew it was there and wondered whether it would ever see the light of day again. And um, In fact, we've had quite a few people coming in just to sort of admire it and say how nice they thought it was. A local charity is picking up the bill. Everything should be finished in time for the church's flower festival in April. Railway enthusiasts from our region have picked up a prestigious award for preservation work on a unique steam engine. The locomotive, which is the last of its kind in the world, was salvaged from the scrap heap in the early 60s. It was taken to Sheringham in North Norfolk, where the Midland and Great Northern Joint Railway Society began restoration work. The Society has been awarded a coat of arms, which was young once used on a royal train, and a fund has now been set up to preserve the engine for future generations. And that is the way the news is looking in the Calendar East region. Now back to Mike and Krista. Now it's a creature that's always been at the sharp end and the butt of people's jokes, but now the long-suffering hedgehog is about to get its own back. An injured hedgehog from Hull is to become a national celebrity because a revived bill from one of our region's MPs will outlaw brutality towards wild animals. Those prosecuted face a prison sentence and that will help our Kelvin. In a moment we'll be talking to Alan Meal about his wild mammals protection bill. First though, Tina Gelder has this report. Kelvin the hedgehog needs the cover of a hot water bottle to keep him warm until his spines grow back. He was sprayed red with toxic paint and ended up bald. At the Hull Hedgehog Hospital, his convalescence has begun. It's actually propolis cream. Um, it's made by bees, actually. And it's a natural antibiotic and anti-inflammatory. And uh, it seems to be doing the trick. It's cleansing his skin and uh, also making it nice and supple. And um, there's a miracle going on here because he's actually growing some more prickles. You can feel them coming through. A 14-year-old schoolboy alleged to have carried out the attack can't be prosecuted, but that could all change. Tomorrow, a bill from the Mansfield MP, Alan Meal, has its second reading in Parliament. It would offer the first legal protection for all wild animals. Kelvin, meanwhile, is at the centre of a campaign by the RSPCA. don't want to cast gloom and doom, but we come across regular, serious incidents of cruelty to wild animals which we cannot pursue through the courts, and that's why we think it's necessary. Kelvin's story is just one of many, but it's hoped his plight will end acts of gratuitous cruelty towards helpless creatures. You can't understand why they do it, can you? Well, in Westminster studio is the Mansfield MP, Alan Meal. Mr Meal, how will your bill help animals like little Kelvin there? A horrible thing to do, to paint him and kick him about like a football. Well, that's right. The, the bill as laid down tomorrow, if it's approved, will make it illegal to kick, beat, burn, stab, impale, drown, drag, you know, a whole host of, of different offences which are regularly carried out against wild animals which aren't protected under the law as it now stands. The only piece of legislation on the statute book was passed in 1911 and it was only to do with domestic animals. Now, another MP from the region, Kevin McNamara, and then John McFall, an MP from Scotland, in recent years have tried to get this bill through and it's been talked out in the Lords uh, or in the Commons. Now, I think tomorrow we've got a real chance. Good, good. Just, just what are you wanting? What extra powers are you wanting for the RSPCA? Because they always say we're so helpless when we come across a case like this. Well, it is. What, what we want, this bill marks a, a landmark in important general legislation for animal welfare, for wild animal uh, uh, welfare. What it will do, it will enable the courts and RSPC officers and indeed the police to actually take action against the thousands of cases which are found every year against a whole variety of wild animals, whether they be foxes, hedgehogs, deer, a whole range of them. It's the most dastardly things occur year in, year out. Well, I hope you don't think I've been political when we wish you well, and uh, we'll speak to you again probably tomorrow. Thanks okay. very much. You're wearing an I Love Kelvin bag. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, some sad news for all you gourmet food lovers out there. The Barnsley Chop is facing the chop. Actually, the chop itself will live on, so despair not. But the restaurant that's become its spiritual home may be demolished to make way for a supermarket. 
So are they crying into their mint sauce down in South Yorkshire? Chris Kiddy's been investigating. Doddoth near Barnsley, where men are men and meat is a serious business. This is Doddoth, where men are men and meat is a serious business. I've just said that, haven't I? Do you know what a Barnsley chop is? Uh, I've no idea. Never heard of it, mate. You must know, you're from <laughs> Barnsley. No idea. Well, these Barnsley chops are straight-talking John Smith told me. A Barnsley chop is a cut of lamb from a whole saddle. Well, we buy whole saddles of lamb, we trim them, and we cut them into three. So there are only three Barnsley chops per sheep. He's probably seen more Barnsley chops than you've had hot dinners. They serve upwards of 150 a week at this Doddoth eatery, and their fame has spread far and wide. We've sent recipes right out to Australia to an immigrant British butcher in one part of Australia, who now sells it to the Australians in Australia. It was served to the Prince of Wales at the Town Hall in 1933. But alas and alack, the home of the chop could face the axe. Jim wants to retire next year, and a developer with an eye on the place wants to turn the site into a supermarket instead. Sad for me, sad for my wife, yes. We've enjoyed our life working here. And it's had its ups and downs and moments of stress, but it's had 90% more happiness to it than uh, one would look at from the outside. Do you know what a Barnsley chop is? It's uh... A sort of big lamb, lamb chop, isn't it? You know, don't you? Mm. You know, fun, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen Chris Kiddy since that report, have you? I don't know, because he's actually <laughs> stuffing his face with these. Rest in peace. There we go. Oh, Bird of the ashes at cricket. We've got the Barnsley chop here in the Canada studio. Now, after the Welks last night, promise you're not going to make me eat that, are you? Yeah, we had a problem with the Welks. Shall we reveal the truth one day? No, we'll never tell you what really happened with the Welks. Let's That's it from us. <laughs> Let's reveal instead Christine and tonight. But I know the truth. Yes, hello and welcome to tonight. We've got John Baxter and a pigeon with bad feet. Trish goes bouldering and stand by to see Gaynor as you've never seen her before. <laughs> Tonight on Tonight, John Baxter's here with the tale of the poorly pigeon, but with a little ingenuity and super glue, it's a happy ending. Gaynor and Brett have been sampling more school dinners. What do they feed the kids when the fees are £10,000 a year? And our action girl Trish has been learning about another secret sport. Tonight it's bouldering. No idea what it's about? Well, keep watching. That's tonight on Tonight. Hello and welcome to Thursday on Tonight and welcome also to John Baxter, our vet, and his nurse Bernie Scatchard. John is here tonight to talk about pigeons, but uh, you look more like a penguin tonight. What are you doing? Well, it is Buns tonight, but I'm not going to a Buns supper. I'm going to talk at the Civic Hall to the Wheatfields Hospice annual dinner. And no haggis on the menu? Well, there's a special wee bit for me, I, I would think. I thought so for a Scot like you. Yeah. Who's this? Well, this is a, just a, a wee pigeon we keep at the surgery just now, but I've really brought it in to show you that this is a good method if you have a legless pigeon and you want to give it a bit of pigeon physiotherapy. It's made up from this paper harness like this. You just build it around the pigeon and then you can give it a wee bit of, see, physiotherapy, so it can use oh, its legs right. and yet stay upright. And you can feed it in an upright position. And if, it's, if you're busy, you can always hang it up somewhere and come back to it later when you're not so busy. So what's wrong with this pigeon? What's the problem? Nothing. This one's OK. I just brought it in to show you how the harness works. So you because... drag the poor thing in off the street just for us? No, no. It's a, it's a homing pigeon. It belongs to quite a, a well-known pigeon breeder in Horsford. Do you treat many pigeons? Quite a few, yeah. What kind of injuries do they usually have? Because they are quite vulnerable, I would have imagined. They are. The worst one is either if they're racing pigeons and they fly too low, they can get ripped on barbed wire fences and you have to stitch them up. Or a lot of them get this thing wrong with their feet where they get stuff wound around their feet, cuts in and they can lose legs, toes, the lot. Well, we're about to see one very such pigeon. Let's have a look at uh, what you could do for that one. Looks a bit like beer, this is, rather than antiseptic <laughs> solution, doesn't it? Ah, that's good. You know, vets get all kinds of animals coming in through the surgery door, even pigeons with bad feet. But this one was spotted by a Yorkshire television security man. He looked out and outside the main building, there's this poor wee bird hobbling about. And it was so poorly, he was able to pick it up and bring it to me. 
And you can just see the results of the problem. Around its feet were wound bits of thread and nylon. You've probably seen them about the cities with toes missing and things, and this is what happens. Thread gets caught around, acts like a ligature, cuts into the skin, and you see here, it's cut into the skin of the leg, cut into the skin of the toe, and here, in actual fact, it cut in so much that a toe dropped off. Well, despite losing that toe, this foot is now fully functional. But this one, I'm afraid, has got contraction of the tendons and the toes are curling under. So although it can put the foot down, it can't spread the toes the way it should. So we've had a wee device made, it wasn't hard, made it a wee bit of cardboard, like this. And what we're doing is, I'll tell you what, let's just dry the feet off first, Bernie, quickly, like that. Then we put the wee bit of cardboard, like that, on its foot, put the toes like that, so the cardboard is actually holding the toes in place. And then with a little piece of bandage, we just put this round the foot, like that, and the cardboard holds the toes where I want them. And to keep it there, we need a wee bit of elastoplast. Hear the budgie in the background? Mm -hmm. Just thinking, oh, am I next? That's lovely. Let's see where we look be. There it is. Now then, bird. So, steady, steady, steady. So you see the idea. Now it can stand on that. 